he's Gex. Is Gex still good? Gex is a 2D platformer originally released on the ill-fated 3DO and later ported to both the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn. The game was successful enough to spawn an entire trilogy. With 3D sequels Gex Enter the Gecko and Gex Deep Cover Gecko following in 1998 and 1999 respectively. But today we're looking at the 3DO original which was well received upon release. Electronic Gaming Monthly scored the game an 8.6 out of 10. If there was ever a game surrounded by endless hype and development time, Gex has to be it. But the long wait was well worth it. Gex proves to be one of the best action games ever seen on the 3DO. Game Fan Magazine gave the game a 9.2 out of 10, noting, 2D power on the 3DO? Who'd have thunk it? Gex not only features many hours of platforming bliss, but high replay value as well. Finally, Game Pro Magazine scored the game a perfect 10 out of 10, proclaiming, This much delayed game was well worth the time it took to molt it into its final form. Gex is destined to become the 3DO equivalent of Sonic or Mario, as this cool little lizard sets high standards for all future 3DO platform hoppers. So is Gex still this good? Let's dive in. The game opens with an FMV cutscene introducing the main protagonist, a gecko named Gex. Unfortunately, he swallows a bugged bug, allowing the villain Rez to reach out through Gex's television and bring him into the media dimension. Rex plans to turn Gex into the new media mascot, and Gex can only escape by finding the hidden TV remotes to progress and finally return home. The structure of Gex is simple. You start at a hub world with four televisions representing four worlds in the game. Only one is initially selectable, Cemetery. Inside Cemetery World is a single selectable level. Enter this and the platforming begins. On the surface, Gex is a standard mascot platformer. Gex can run, jump, and tail whip, making his way from the beginning of the level to the exit. However, there are some interesting gimmicks. First, Gex has a tongue lash, used for devouring power-ups. These can give you extra lives, refill your life bar, and extend your life bar. Some give Gex projectile attacks, including fireballs, ice balls, and electric bolts. Others give Gex a boost of speed and even invincibility. However, you can also tail whip any power-up to refill a single paw of life, foregoing the power-up altogether. Since there are 10 of these and they all look similar, you can screw yourself out of extra lives if you aren't paying attention, but I appreciate the game for giving the player a choice. There are also golden flies to collect. These work like rings or coins, and collecting 100 will award an extra life. Finally, Gex can stick to walls and ceilings, allowing you to walk on virtually any surface without the ill effects of gravity. Even cooler, you can walk on the background in designated areas, allowing for some alternative gameplay mechanics. The controls can be overwhelming at first, with all three action buttons being utilized for different tasks, as well as a shoulder button being used for running. But you'll use each and every skill Gex possesses often enough, where the controls become second nature rather quickly. While Gex is not a collectathon by any stretch, you do have to nab the remote found in each level. Before each level, the loading screen will tell you how many there are to find, and they aren't hidden at all. These are always out in the open, and you'll only miss them if you aren't paying close enough attention. Once you nab the remote and make it to the exit, you are dropped back into the world map, and can then use the remote to turn on the next television, and thus the next level. Overall, the cemetery levels do an awesome job presenting a light challenge while teaching all the nuances of the controls. For example, you can press down while in the air to bounce off enemies. This can be used defensively so you don't take damage when landing on an enemy, but can also be used to bounce off enemies to reach secret areas. The projectile attacks also do different things. The flame attack will torch the televisions, taking them out immediately. With a normal tail whip, they drop and then explode after 5 seconds. The ice attack is interesting as well, as it freezes enemies, creating makeshift platforms if you want. After making your way through the four cemetery levels and collecting all of the remotes, we arrive at a boss. This is easy, just jump and tail whip and you'll find yourself victorious in short order. 
Upon defeat, you'll receive a special remote allowing you to access the next world map. Continuing with the television theme, Gex now finds himself in New Toon Land. As one would expect, the art style here is dramatically different, with bright visuals, a complete lack of realism, and plenty of cartoon enemies. Thankfully, this isn't simply more of the same, and the level structure is changed up. Twin Towers, for example, relies heavily on jumping onto the background and using this to traverse vertically. Since you can't jump, it alters the way you attack different challenges, as you rely on running to dodge obstacles. POW is another interesting level, with a massive amount of breakable objects blocking your path. Since enemies can be on top of these destructible objects, you need to plan your moves accordingly so you aren't ambushed by enemies. Rocket greatly expands on the climbing, forcing you to maneuver on moving rockets. It all adds up for a world that expands upon the lessons learned in the first world, increasing the challenge in a fun way. This brings us to the second boss. While the first one could be beat by spamming attacks, this one requires pattern recognition. First, you need to jump over this farting man. It's clever in a way, and you actually have to use the sound of the fart to time your jump. If you go strictly by visual cues, you'll jump too late. After this, you need to climb up to the ceiling and drop anvils on the guy. It's not the best boss fight I've ever fought, but I do appreciate how timing and skill are required for success. Gex then travels to Jungle Isle. A few tried and true platforming staples are introduced here, including trying to stay on a moving platform as it travels through the level, as well as some auto-scrolling sections where you need to race through quickly to avoid getting squished. The boss battle is also switched up, having you jump towards the top of a tall level avoiding the boss, instead of engaging in battle. Strangely enough, despite there being a massive world map, there are just two stages and a boss fight here, so it's off to Kung Fuville. As Gex enters the fourth world, the difficulty is cranked up. In fact, I planned on reviewing this game last year, but hit a difficulty wall I couldn't get past, and I eventually gave up. First, there are some tricky enemies shooting out electric bolts. The best way around these guys is jumping on the ceiling or the faces of buildings and get in your shots between attacks. Next, there is a plethora of collapsing platforms. These were initially featured in New Toon Land, with large dynamite sticks exploding shortly after landing on them. Here, the dynamite sticks actually cause a chain reaction, exploding with or without your help. It creates for some tense moments where you are required to utilize the run button or land in death pits. Next are some amped up water sections. In Jungle Isle, you learned how to navigate the water as well as jump out. Here, the water actually changes colors. When clear, Gex can maneuver like normal, but once the water changes colors, it will damage him. This forces you to move fast and make quick decisions as there is little time for hesitation. Chop Chop can be hard as well, with platforms slowly sinking into the red death goo. You have to run, jump, and climb your way up and across these moving platforms quickly and efficiently, avoiding whatever this red stuff is. After making your way through the platforming Olympics, Gex arrives at boss number 4. This turtle returns to form, offering a healthy mix of learning patterns and platforming skill to avoid the turtle's attacks. Even cooler, the turtle gets bigger with each hit, making the projectiles and the turtle itself trickier to avoid as they take up more real estate. With the turtle defeated, Gex now has completed all four world maps found on the hub from the beginning of the adventure. The remote then breaks open the media tower, and Gex enters a fifth world, Rosopolis. There are just two levels in Rosopolis, but these levels are absolutely brutal. First, Gex gets very stingy with the power-ups, meaning you won't have many opportunities to use the fire, ice, and electric attacks. Instead, you'll have to get up close with the enemies to take them out. Next, there are pits filled with TV static everywhere, and one wrong step will kill Gex. Finally, those TV static pits pits are constantly spitting out bubbles, giving the player yet another obstacle to constantly contend with. On the move is a worthy final level. The designers had a final trick up their sleeve, conveyor belts. And what we are left with is a tough gauntlet to the final boss. The constant assault of moving belts, bottomless pits, dangerous bubbles, plenty of spikes, as well as an abundance of exploding television enemies make for quite the challenge. You'll be forced to jump from vertical platforms while bouncing off enemies, and even navigate on moving belts on the ceiling in some cramped spaces. It's too for sure, and a perfect way to wrap up the platforming, segueing us to the final boss. 
Gex meets up with Rez in a location ripped straight from the opening cinematic, which is pretty cool. Basically, all you need to do is jump across the television platforms, which are on a timer and explode, then break a capsule containing a bug. Use the tongue lash to slurp up the bug, and then fire the bug back at Rez. Unfortunately, if Rez is flashing, he's invincible, so you have to time your attacks appropriately. His attacks range from slightly annoying, like when he chucks what I presume is a remote control at you, to easy to predict wave attacks, and finally some hard electric attacks which I never really got down. His final attack is a laser, but it doesn't pose a real threat, so yeah. In any case, after hitting Rez with five bugs, he goes down and then disappears out of the dome. Gex returns to his Barca lounger, and the final scene ends the adventure as unceremoniously as it began. Then, of course, the credits roll. Whipping tail and spitting fire. He's a wizard of a lizard. So, wrapping things up, let me touch base on a few level gimmicks featured throughout the adventure. At various points in most levels, some TV static will appear. Pressing up will warp you to a new area of the level. As they are hidden, these areas will offer plenty of bonus goodies and golden flies, in addition to warping you further into the level upon completion. Sometimes, these static warps will take you to a bonus level. These bonus areas are like minigames with a strict timer and a set of goals to complete. The better you do at the minigame, the more bonus items you will receive, like extra lives. If you manage to beat the minigame, you get a piece of a remote. If you beat the bonus area in each of the worlds, you unlock Planet X. Unfortunately, I was not able to beat any of the bonus minigames and never made it to Planet X. Apparently, beating all of the Planet X levels will unlock an extended credit sequence with concept art and other extras. I do like the bonuses being optional, and they offer some serious replayability. With the gameplay out of the way, let's move on to the technical aspects of Gex. As one would expect from a CD-based game, there is a ton of audio here. Cemetery has some excellent synth rock with plenty of organ and haunting effects, giving a nice high energy sound while still matching the creepy visuals. New Toon Land follows suit with more rock style music, but an emphasis on piano. It reminds me of the score you'd find in an 80s comedy. Jungle Isle is more traditional, with plenty of drum beats and other percussions in addition to some African chanting. I can't say for certain how authentic this music is, but it fits the surroundings decent enough. Kung Fuville again has an 80s flair to it, with some wind instruments giving a vague nod to the Far East. The music in the final world is like a mixture of everything, with synthesized sounds, plenty of guitar and drums, and percussion. The only thing missing is the jungle chanting. Overall, I rather enjoy the soundtrack, but nothing here is particularly memorable. There are no catchy compositions to get stuck in your head, but for background music, it works well. Of course, you can't talk about Gax without mentioning the voice acting. Gex is voiced by Dana Gould, so the delivery is excellent, which is a good thing because you are going to hear a lot of it. Sporadically, when Gex jumps, tail whips, or just whenever, a cheesy one-liner is delivered. Thankfully, most of these change in each world, delivering jokes more in line with the specific set pieces. If you don't like them, you can shut them off in the options menu, which is a thoughtful touch. This brings us to the graphics. First, it's fairly obvious Gex could not have been done on the Sega Genesis or the Super Nintendo. The color count is high, and as best as I can tell, there is no dithering whatsoever. The sheer variety is also outstanding, thanks to the massive boost in space a CD had over a cartridge. Other than a few enemies, almost nothing is recycled in each of the five worlds. Even better, there is never a drop in quality. From the opening level to the final level, the sprites are well animated, the detail is off the charts, and the backgrounds are terrific. I also like the multiple layers of parallax scrolling, giving a nice sense of depth. There are even scaling effects and a ton of transparency, be it shadows, power-ups, or tubes. While many of these things could be found on certain Genesis or Super Nintendo games, you rarely saw all of these utilized at the same time, helping Gex feel like a next-gen title. And then, of course, there is Gex himself. As was the norm for the time, he is a pre-rendered sprite, giving the illusion of a 3D-modeled character. 
While I generally don't care for this, the increased color count and the quality of the model is hardly offensive, and since nothing else in the game uses this effect, it helps sell the idea that Gex does not belong in the media dimension. He sticks out like a sore thumb. But even better, it allows for some extremely smooth animation. The way Gex walks and climbs looks incredibly realistic, especially as he makes his way around different angles. In fact, everything Gex does looks outstanding, from the simple act of jumping and tongue lashing to the basic tail whip. Gex moves with a fluidity nearly unmatched for the time. However, all of this technical wizardry comes at a price. The frame rate is sluggish. The opening level refreshes at a respectable 30 frames per second, but when the action gets thick, the frame rate can drop to as low as 15 frames per second. Compared to 16-bit offerings running at 60 frames per second, it can be disappointing. I'm not sure if this is a result of the game being rushed, or if 2D sprites were not a strong suit for the 3DO hardware. So with all of that out of the way, we arrive back to the question asked at the beginning of the video, is Gex still good? First, let's take a look at the things Gex does well. The controls are responsive, with decent acceleration, deceleration, and nice mid-air maneuverability. I also like how momentum is carried when using the tail whip, allowing you to attack enemies without grinding to a halt. On the flip side, the momentum can make landing on small platforms extremely tricky. You must let off the D-pad completely, otherwise Gex will hit the ground running right off a platform. Thankfully, it seems the developers were aware of this, and Gex contains very few small platforms. Next, the level design is way above average. Gex never asks anything impossible from the player, always delivering a cohesive experience with goals logically laid out. There are few blind jumps, enemy placement rarely surprises the player, and as a whole, Gex is a relatively frustration-free experience. However, the challenge is still quite high, but it's always fair. Gex does a wonderful job slowly ramping up the difficulty, for teaching you a skill and then requiring you to master it as the adventure moves on. I've already noted this with the water and the dynamite, but even moving platforms are introduced thoughtfully. These are first introduced in Rocket, where failing didn't result in death. Later on, you're forced to use the skills learned earlier and apply them to a much deadlier situation. In the first level, some golden flies suggest you should jump and then stick to the side of a platform, a critical move required throughout the game. The game gently guides you through the process without a tutorial level or an annoying text box. Gex also strikes the perfect balance of offering linear level design, meaning it's virtually impossible to get confused or lost, while also providing a ton of branching paths, hidden secrets, warp areas, and even little sirens that alter the level layout when you tail whip them. It makes for levels that are straightforward to get through the first time, but also encourage exploring for subsequent playthroughs. I also have to mention the checkpoints and continues. First, checkpoints are plentiful throughout each level, assuring you rarely have to repeat anything too often, causing the game to feel repetitive. However, if you run out of lives, you're stuck reloading your previous save. On the world maps, you'll notice a few TVs have VCRs. This means there is a hidden VHS tape in the actual level. If you collect this and beat the level, the game saves. Sadly, these are limited to one per world. On the plus side, when you die, you are brought back to the world map, meaning you can revisit an easy level and grind for lives. The first level is great for this, offering over 100 golden flies, two extra life power-ups in addition to the bonus minigame where you can earn quite a few more. If you're adverse to continues or don't want to repeat levels after loading a save, it's a great alternative. Better yet, when you go back to the later level, your checkpoint remains, which is awesome. About the only thing I don't like with the saving is your life stack isn't retained. I shut the game down with over 20 lives, but when I resume the following day, it reset to 3, which is lame. Speaking of negatives, Gex can be occasionally glitchy. Now, I'm not one to push the boundaries of a game to find glitches, but twice I got stuck in a wall. It seems under certain circumstances, the water doesn't kill you, 
and you continue through it. Both times I eventually got out so I didn't have to reboot my 3DO, but it's annoying nonetheless. Next, I have to mention the final boss. I found if I attacked the final boss during moments the programmers didn't anticipate, the level would stop scrolling. Now, you have to jump across the TVs here, because they explode. And I found myself forced to move left, hoping the camera would catch up. Eventually, I learned when to attack to avoid the glitches, but I'm not a fan of artificial limitations. The only other issue is the camera. To be fair, the camera is elastic and will generally place Gex towards the back of the screen, allowing maximum forward visibility, instead of keeping Gex in the center. However, the development team didn't give the player the option to look up or down. As Gex can stick to the ceiling, the ability to look down and figure out where you are landing would have been nice. For the most part, it's rarely an issue, as the level design doesn't require many blind jumps, but on a few occasions I thought I was going to jump on a platform based on the background graphics, but was sadly mistaken. Needless to say, Gex is not a perfect game. The controls are occasionally slippery, the frame rate can be choppy, there are some glitches, and the camera isn't always as flexible as one would like. But aside from these admittedly infrequent issues, I would say, yeah, Gex is still a good game. Surprisingly good even. Gex absolutely gets the fundamentals right, with solid controls, good level design, a fair challenge, progressive difficulty curve, and high production value values, but it also does enough to differentiate itself from other titles of the era, with unique set pieces and well-implemented power-ups. Add all of this together and you are left with a very enjoyable game. Sure, Gex lacks the polish of Sonic or Mario, but if you're a fan of 2D platformers, Gex is a must-own.